Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the John Adams. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams and I am very glad that you've joined us this evening to talk about the Constitution. First question, who of you has read the Constitution? Whoa, good for you. <laughs> I'm proud of you guys. I have read it too, but I have to admit that that was in high school and <clears throat> that was quite a while ago. So I'm looking forward to this evening also as a kind of refresher for my knowledge. We're really happy that uh, thanks to the uh, flexibility of our special guest of today, Kim Whaley, that we're able to do this event on Super Tuesday. Of course, Super Tuesday is a unique phenomenon in the US elections. How many of you looked up Super Tuesday on Wikipedia before you came here and jog my memory? What was that again? Oh, nobody, okay. You're all in the know. Oh, one person back here. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Super Tuesday, who would have thought that this Super Tuesday would be in the, in the middle of this cyclone which these elections are turning into? It's, it's extraordinary. And who would have thought that the Constitution was so hot. Who would have thought that there would be a play, the play by Heidi Schreck, um, uh, the Const what the Constitution means to me, a Broadway play by Heidi Schreck about the Constitution. Who would have thought? But I guess after having had Hamilton, maybe we shouldn't be so surprised after all. A special word of welcome to Kim Whaley as our guest of honor this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, also, a special word of welcome to our uh, co-respondent of the evening, uh, Leiden Law Professor Wim Voermans. Uh, Kim has written a book called How to Read the Constitution and Why. And as she said when I first spoke to her to talk about her coming to Amsterdam for this event, she said, of course, the really important part of the title is the why. Why should we care? Well, there are lots of reasons why we should care and especially why the younger generations should care. And she is on a mission to get us all to realize why we should read the Constitution and why it matters. Wim Voermans, in addition to being a law professor, is also an author. His new book, uh, Het Verhaal van de Grondwet, Zoeken naar wij, came out recently and is soon to be translated into English under the title, The Story of the Constitution, I think the undertitle is, the subtitle is perhaps the best of all, discovering the we in us, which is something I think that uh, in, in, in a United States now torn by partisanship, that this would, I'm sure that you're gonna be a big seller in the US with a subtitle like this. I also want to say a special word of thanks to uh, some of our partners for this evening, to the University of Amsterdam, for allowing us to use this beautiful venue uh, with some frequency. To our pals at Atheneum Bookstore, who always make sure that our author's books are here to be bought and signed. And also to our sponsors and our donors. As you may know, we have no subsidy. Everything we do is made possible by uh, our sponsors, our main sponsors and our corporate members, and our private donors, our friends and our family. And I would like to say a very special word of welcome to our new corporate member of this evening, CLVN. And I know a number of uh, the people affiliated with CLVN are here this evening. And I wanted to say thank you very much for joining us and being part of what we do, part of our important mission. Also, a word of thanks to KLM, who made it possible to bring Kim over. They support us with a few tickets every year and without them, we really couldn't do what we do. And also thanks to the YPO, the Young Presidents Organization. I believe we have with us this evening Auke van den Hout, who's a member of the board. Uh, and they are also hosting an event tomorrow with Kim. We've been running her off her feet, actually. Uh, our book club, the Young Presidents Organization, the room for discussion at the university this afternoon, uh, also an event at the University of Leiden, I gather, at the Montesquieu Institute. Oh, I'm sure you've really been enjoying Amsterdam, right? <laughs> um, I will uh, keep it at this. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Oh yes, that both books, of course, will be for sale and that the authors will be signing later on. After our conversation under the expert guidance of Elko Bos van Rosenthal, 
uh, journalists uh, known from uh, his correspondence uh, time in the US and as the, one of the anchors of Newsure and as a member of our board. Uh, he will have a conversation with our speakers and then I will come back to you at the end of the evening to just give you a, a few insights into upcoming events in the coming months. So now the floor is for Elko. Good evening, everyone, on my behalf as well. When you speak after Tracy, you always have to lift the microphone a little bit. No offense. A warm uh, welcome uh, to everyone. We just had a small dinner with Kim Whaley and Wim Voermans and a bunch of other people talking about the current state of American politics. Um, it turned out to be very depressing. We were quiet for the last 10 minutes with our coffee. Nobody talked. So if you're looking for optimism tonight, you may want to leave <laughs> within the next two or three minutes. But we'll uh, look for some, um, some hope as well. This is an evening on the uh, Constitution. And as Tracy said, we're meeting on Super Tuesday, which means that Democrats in 14 states are casting their votes for the preferred Democratic candidate of their choice, which will eventually lead to a Democratic candidate running against Donald Trump. The primary process is not described in the Constitution. Each party can decide the process for itself. The procedure for the general election is described in the Constitution. And since this is election night, we'll I'll try to squeeze in the, the politics, the primary season, into the discussion as well. But most of all, we're gathered here to discuss the Constitution. If that sounds boring, I don't think it does, and neither do you, because you're all here. But if it would sound boring, it obviously isn't. It's up to the American voters to decide if Donald Trump made America great again, but I do know that he made the U.S. Constitution relevant again. And that is why we're so happy to have Kim Whaley here tonight, who just wrote this wonderful and very insightful book about the Constitution that Tracy just mentioned. Um, the U.S. Constitution is 231 years old. Everything I say tonight about the Constitution, I double-checked, um, because otherwise uh, Kim Whaley will correct me. The Constitution has obviously always been um, relevant, um, but as you state in your book, it is a relatively terse document that leaves much of its meaning unwritten. A standard pocket constitution that you can get on Amazon um, uh, only takes up 17 pages with another of 17, maybe 20 pages of amendments, and that's that. Even though there has always been discussion on how to interpret the Constitution and whether or not the Constitution is a living document, the Constitution always pretty much held strong because there were certain norms and conventions that everybody, politicians as well, presidents as well, would abide to. A presidential candidate would make public their personal finances. The people in the executive branch would hold the experience needed to fulfill their tasks and the loser of a presidential election would concede to the victor and cooperate to guarantee a peaceful transfer of power. Now the latter, the peaceful transfer of power, and we'll get to um, talk about this later, the, the transfer of power after, after losing an election has not been tested in modern times. And if the current president, Donald Trump, would lose re-election, we don't know yet, um, if he would lose the election, there is no reason to believe that there won't be a peaceful transfer of power. However, the fact that this scenario has been discussed over the past years in op-eds and on evenings like this means it actually is an issue. It underlines the extraordinary circumstances that American politics is in right now. There was an impeachment trial recently and the founding fathers and the framers of the Constitution were mentioned for at least hundreds of times. Um, the impeachment managers of the Democratic Party were talking about how the framers, uh, how the founding fathers feared exactly the kind of behavior that President Trump, according to the Democrats, was executing. It shows that the American Constitution is not an ancient relic belonging in a museum, even though you can see it in a museum, the National Archives, Archives in Washington. Um, but it is something that needs to be discussed, as we will do so tonight. 
Now, it is not possible to have a proper discussion about the Constitution in 2020 without bringing up Donald Trump. I don't think it's possible to talk about Donald Trump and give a proper analysis of the Trump presidency without bringing up the Constitution. Um, but Kim Whaley did not write a book about Trump. She did definitely not write a book against Trump. She wrote a book explaining the Constitution, why it was written, what freedoms Americans have because of it, what is not in the Constitution, why certain things are not in the Constitution, how the Founding Fathers, the framers of the Constitution, looked at the role of government in the daily lives of Americans, why the checks and balances in the Constitution are so important. But the reader will also understand, after having read her book, more of the distrust many Americans have of their government. Read the book. It's important and it's very well written. Again, if the Constitution or a whole book about the Constitution sounds boring, it's not at all. We will hear from Kim Whaley in a second after her, like Tracy said, Professor Wim Voermans will take the stage. His book, Het Verhaal van de Grondwet, The Story of the Constitution, will be translated in English later this year. And um, in between, obviously, I'll talk to Kim Whaley uh, about that. And at the end, uh, the three of us will sit over here, talk some more, and then there will be plenty of room for questions. Kim Whaley is a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law. She is a regular commentator and a legal expert for CBS. And in the past, she worked in the Whitewater investigation under independent counsel Kenneth Starr during the Clinton years. He was back during this impeachment trial defending President Trump. And she has practiced law for more than 25 years. I hope you give her a very warm welcome. Please, Kim Whaley. Good evening. Uh, I'm quite humbled to have been invited here, uh, especially with this glittering list of uh, people who came before me, and I'm just very, very grateful for the invitation and for the kind introduction um, about um, this very important topic, and thank you for coming. Uh, I, I, this is not about Trump, but I have to say it is a bit about, I'm going to reference a prior president, the second president, John Adams, because why not? Because it's a John Adams Institute. Uh, and he said, as president, I refused to suffer insolence. I sighed, sobbed, and groaned, and sometimes screeched and screamed, and I must confess to my shame and sorrow that I sometimes swore. Um, and I read that and I said, well, that sounds a little bit like perhaps our current president of the United States, um, although even Benjamin Franklin said, he means well for his country, is always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes, and in some things, absolutely out of his senses. Um, and maybe that could characterize Donald Trump. I think there are some differences between the two. Uh, I'm going to reference John Adams a number of times because having read this book, uh, or written this book, read it many times, and then gone back and looked at some of the writings of John Adams, there are some very consistent themes across 230 years that are deeply relevant in this moment. Now, as Tracy mentioned, the book is called How to Read the Constitution and Why, and there are two words there that are really important. Um, the one, the first word is the word read. And as I tell my law students, I, you are going to learn how to read in law school. And they say, wait a minute, I've learned, I knew how to read in, when I was six years old in kindergarten. Um, but people today who are used to being on their phones and tweeting and et cetera, don't necessarily have the skill of reading one word in context asking themselves what are the various interpretations of that word, asking themselves how, what, are the, what are the implications of interpreting it one way or another, and then deciding on the context uh, of their audience, for example, and then de determining what is the best interpretation in that moment. And that is what the Supreme Court does with this very old document called the Constitution, we hear a lot of debate about ways of reading the Constitution, the right way, the wrong way, plain language reading, 
uh, reading it in, as a living constitution, etc. But anyone who's read a poem or a, uh, an old religious text knows that old words, short verses have various interpretations and that can scare people. Americans sometimes get quite nervous when they realize that the Constitution is actually a lot of gray area. There's a lot of vagueness in the Constitution, which makes it a bit vulnerable, a bit, as I say, this is not a legal term, squishy. Um, and squishiness means uh, that this Constitution itself is fragile. And that is the message that I'm, I try to convey through the book and through my public appearances. The other important word in the title is the word, as Tracy said, why. Why read the Constitution? And I, also, as I teach my students, you can learn a rule in law school um, that you, you cannot uh, murder someone, for example, or kill someone. Um, and the question can be, understood even better if you ask why. Why do we have a rule against killing people, for example? Well, morally it might be wrong, but it also orders our society. And if you understand the why behind rules, the what is the rule makes a lot, of more sense, a lot more sense. And in America, when we learn the Constitution, if we learn it at all in school, we learn the what, but not the why. Um, I have four children, and, uh, and I've taught them all how to ride bikes. And I also tell my students that to learn how to ride a bike, I can sit in, on a, at a podium for 13 weeks and tell them how to ride the bike. You put your leg over the bike, you sit on the seat, you kind of balance a little bit. They will still get on the bike and fall a few times before they actually learn how to ride the bike. And understanding the American Constitution is like that. You have to get on the bike and ride the bike a few times to really understand how functionally it works. Now, unfortunately, um, as I mentioned, Americans don't know a lot about the Constitution. A study done in 2015 found that more than two thirds could not name all three branches of the United States federal government, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the executive branch. Um, and those who know American TV might know Judge Judy, who's been on television for 25 years and is finally wrapping up her reign as a TV judge, resolving slip and fall cases and small disputes. Um, another study that was done of recent college students found that 10% of Americans thought Judge Judy was on the United States Supreme Court. And so why does this matter? Why is this concern, concerning? Um, and I will quote again, for the, not the last time tonight, quote John Adams, liberty cannot be presumed without general knowledge among the people. Uh, understanding how government really works is critical to preserving government. Uh, and there's another element to that that really has to do with psychology the Constitution, I think, has a lot to do with psychology. And I think people, uh, psychologists for many decades will be analyzing this particular president in addition to historians. And the psychological piece, again, John Adams, um, he wrote, power must be opposed to power and interest to interest. Uh, Madison is the one who gets the quote these days, which is ambition must be made to counteract ambition. He was quoted many times during the Senate impeachment power, uh, trial. But in plain common sense, today's English, what does that mean? It means it's human nature, if you have access to power, to hang on to it, to try to get more of it, and for some people to ultimately abuse it, even if you're abusing it in, way, in ways that you believe are for the better good. Uh, and we know this in our regular lives. Uh, we, my two daughters work at a restaurant in the summers, and they're very great kids. They have a lot of integrity. They're honest. They're hardworking. But there are rules at the restaurant. Uh, they have to show up on time. They have to wait their tables properly. Uh, they obviously can't 
you know, take food on the way out the door for themselves. And why are there rules for a restaurant? Even though there are these honest girls that are working at this restaurant, it's because it's human nature to take advantage of positions of power. And for the restaurant to not have rules, it, it could close. And it's not just having rules, but it's enforcing those rules. If the restaurant doesn't enforce its rules for its employees, people will stop going and eventually it will close. And in, for the American government in this moment, the federal American government, the question really is not so much are there rules, because there are rules in that short constitution, but are the rules being enforced? Because if the rules are not being enforced, the rules themselves don't matter anymore to govern people's conduct in office. Um, another example I like to use is speed limits. We have lots of them in Washington. The traffic is really difficult and uh, you know, weighs on us all if you live there. Uh, and, and a few blocks in Washington, everyone slows down and goes slower than 35 miles an hour and then they'll just all of a sudden pick up the speed. Why? Because all of a sudden they decided I'm going to follow the 35 miles per hour rule? No, it's because there's a hidden speed camera that will deliver the dreaded ticket in the mail with the photo of your license plate and they don't want the consequence. That rule is enforced in that block. After that block, people speed up. The rule is the same. The rule is the same. So the question for Americans right now is, what do we the people do? How can we enforce the Constitution? How can we put those rules into action through consequences? Uh, and I'll call this axis one of the Constitution. My book is broken into two parts. The structural Constitution, which is not usually discussed even in law schools. That is what people call the separation of powers. The system of checks and balances, which meanwhile, Neither of those terms are anywhere in the Constitution. But the job description of government is set up so no one gets all the power. Everyone gets their papers graded by the other two branches. You want to know whether the president can do something, you ask yourself, what are the consequences that the legislature can impose or the judicial branch can impose? Then you'll have your answer. If there are no consequences, the answer to the first question, can he do it, is yes not because it's banned by the Constitution, but because no one is enforcing it. And that structure is really critical for axis two of the Constitution. What is axis two, A-X-I-S two? That is what most people learn about if they learn anything about the Constitution, and that is the, what we call the Bill of Rights. Rights in the Constitution, the First Amendment right to free speech and free religion, the Second Amendment right to bear arms, the Fourth Amendment right to, to, uh, 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 to prevent unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, when I, I give this talk in the United States, I'll often ask people in the audience, what is a right? And I won't do that tonight. I won't put anybody on the spot. Um, but usually I'll get an answer that says, it's what I'm born with. That's my right. I'm born with this right. And many Americans believe that about the Constitution. It's my right under the Constitution, my constitutional right. But when you probe that a little bit, it's okay, what does that really mean? Do you have a right to enter your home at the end of the day when you come home from work? If you're paying your rent, paying your utilities, whatever. Sure, that's my home. In the, under the Constitution, that's one of the most sacred spaces uh, that the framers cared about, your home. Well, if you come home one day and all of a sudden there's a circle of police officers, armed police officers, we do have armed, lots of arms in the United States, they're circling your house and you can't get in your house. What happened to your right? You can't call the police, right, at that point? What do you do? Well, you have to figure out another way to enforce your right. You go to a court, get a court order, get that order enforced to get the police to let you in your home. And I say this because even a constitutional right is only as valuable as it is enforceable. It becomes meaningful when you go to court and get an order to tell government to leave you alone. The right doesn't enforce itself. Um, that's the second access to the Constitution, 
axis that most people think about, but it actually is directly related back to the first axis of the Constitution. If Americans do not have an accountable government that has consequences for bad behavior, then the rights ultimately can fall by the wayside. And again, I was taken by, uh, John Adams wrote, liberty, according to my metaphysics, is a self-determining power in an intellectual agent. It implies thought and choice and power. The ability to keep government off your back is really about our core humanity. It's about our ability to think, to speak freely. If we can speak freely, we can think freely. If we cannot speak freely, then we can't think freely. We feel inhibited in our own thoughts. We lose our humanity. It's absolutely foundational um, to an ordered society. That's what the framers understood as liberty. So I'll get a little bit detailed here because I know people want to know more about impeachment, right? That carried the day, the headlines for many weeks. I was on CBS News many times talking day to day with impeachment. And I think it's important because again, what are the checks? What are the consequences for violating norms in the White House right now? And the takeaway that I have as a constitutional scholar from impeachment is that the belt and suspenders of the office of the presidency has expanded substantially and will be handed off to the next president, whether it's a Democrat, Republican. It will not be the particular president in office forever, but the office will expand. So under the Constitution, again, you ask yourself, if the president does something, what are the checks? You can ask yourself, okay, the judicial branch. Well, you may have heard the Department of Justice has a policy for its prosecutors that they do not indict a sitting president. That's not in the Constitution, it's not in a law. It's an internal employee manual. But what does that mean? It means the judicial branch is out. Get out your black Sharpie, cross the judicial branch out as a means of holding the presidency accountable, presidency, for potential crimes in office. What's left, of course? the legislative branch, right? Ways that the legislative branch can hold the president accountable. The president's lawyers in the Senate trial walked through all of these and said, listen, if you, Senate, vote not to convict, there's all kinds of ways you can still hold the president accountable. Appropriations, meaning Congress can control the presidency by controlling the money, but of course, for any of you who know the story, one of the big objections to what happened with the money that was withheld by the president for Ukraine that gave rise to the impeachment was that the Senate had appropriated that money. So by not holding this president accountable for ignoring Congress's decision on how to spend money, that rule no longer has force. The appropriations rule can be kind of shrugged off now. Number two, pass laws to bind the president. Well, we had laws including that if the president was going to hold up aid under the Impoundment Act, had to let the Congress know. That law was not enforced by the Congress. So legislation becomes optional. Oversight hearings. Congress can gather facts, hear from witnesses, hear from, hear, hear, get documents, and shed public scrutiny through transparency on what the White House is doing. Second article of impeachment was stonewalling or refusing to turn over any documents to Congress. Uh, there was an acquittal on that and a federal court this week said we are not hearing any challenges to the president's refusal or the White House's refusal to turn over information. So now going forward, presidents as the dissenting judge, the judge who disagreed with that case wrote in the D.C. Circuit, the number two court, court in the United States said, listen, now, now we've got presidents in the future who don't have to answer to co congressional requests for information. The last one, in addition to impeachment, would be deciding on who gets to be in the White House, who gets to be in the president's cabinet. The 
the Constitution sets up a process whereby the Senate, the President appoints top level officials, the Senate then has confirmation hearings. You might have seen this uh, or heard about it with the last Supreme Court Justice, Brett Kavanaugh, that was appointed, went through a confirmation process. Well, this president has had his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, conducting foreign policy without having gone through that process. Um, so, I, again, I have four kids. I raise these children, <laughs> understanding that if there are rules and you don't enforce them one time, no eating pizza on the couch, except during the Super Bowl. You, your six-year-old knows that couch, no eating pizza rule is, doesn't count anymore, right? The next day and the next day, it's chips and it's candy and it's whatever, apples or whatever, right? Um, it's human nature to understand without consequences, the rules are optional. And we now have a moment in American democracy where some of these rules are optional for presidents. Um, and I, you know, I get critiques from both sides of the political aisle, because I could be quite critical of you know, Democrats and how they've handled impeachment, and of course, some of the things that are happening with this presidency. The, the issue here is not the person, it's the office. It's the job description of the office and enforcing it. And again, here's our friend um, John Adams. There is a danger from all men, the only maxim of a free government ought to be to trust no man living with power to endanger the public liberty. The idea being, again, it's psychology. You have to have a job description. You have to have consequences for violating the job description to manage human beings' worst instincts. Uh, that's the idea. That's the concept that goes way back to the founding that is lost in the day-to-day I think onslaught, for lots of reasons, we might get into it in discussion, uh, social media, misinformation, uh, inaccuracies from the White House, and just overwhelming overload that Americans get. It's very hard to sort through this. And one of the objectives of the book is to give a baseline for discussion um, so that going forward, we can have some core principles that animated the presidency and the, the American democracy to begin with. Um, so I like, to, I like to oftentimes talk about uh, an analogy in this regard because we are so polarized in America. We've become team blue or team red and Americans care a lot about their sports. I'm not a sports person, um, but you know, if you're a Red Sox fan, you're a Red Sox fan for life. Uh, and I think that's where we are. We're a Red Sox fan for life. We're a blue fan, we're a red fan, or we're a red team, blue team for life. But of course, any sports game assumes there's umpires or officials that are making sure that people follow the rules. If that stops happening, you feel like the rules are being violated and there are no consequences, people stop believing in the legitimacy of the game. And that's the concern in part. And so I like to use this analogy, which is that imagine that we have a constitution bridge over a rushing river that's quite treacherous. We have blue cars and red cars coming across the bridge and we have blue cops and red cops and the red cops pick on the blue cars and the blue cops pick on the red cars and then all of a sudden the people in the red cars hate the blue cars or dislike them or fight with them or see them as a, a, a enemies. The people on the blue cars, vice versa. Eventually no one's paying attention to the bridge. The infrastructure of the bridge is corroding, the grouting is falling apart and the bridge goes down. And I'll ask my students, okay, who survives that? And of course the answer is nobody. It's we the people, not we the Democrats, we the Republicans. And so this is of course uh, Super Tuesday and I don't wanna leave it on a down note. I do think that we have some things to be hopeful for. Uh, one is we need a cop on the Constitution block. And in November, 2020, not just the president's the presidency's on the ballot, but a lot of members of the United States Senate um, and shifting the configuration of Congress could kick them back into life where they actually function as a, a mechanism of oversight. They're aligned with their body, their institution, and the people they represent and not the party and whoever's in power in office. That's number one. 
Um, number two is starting out with, like, back to where I started, this idea of the Constitution not being black and white. We live in a world where there's a lot of black and white thinking, and most hard things in life are gray, right? When we have to make difficult decisions, we make the pros and we make the cons and we weigh all that, and there's not a clear answer if it's a really hard decision, and American democracy is messy. And so I challenge people to make a decision that changes their mind or can sit, think about things in a way that forces you to change your mind, challenge yourself to change your mind. Um, and if that can happen, I think we can see some change. Young people know how to do that. Uh, older people have a harder time, I think. Number three is a return to basics, to facts, to, to you know, this is a bottle of water. It really is. We're in the United States. There's a lot of what's called gaslighting going on where this is not a bottle of water. This is a glass of milk. And people say, really? I think this is a bottle of water. I, sw I swear it's a bottle of water. And you start going a little bit crazy, right? And that becomes disorienting. A return to facts, again, John Adams. Facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. The Senate impeachment trial, the facts, even without witnesses, the narrative was very clear on the facts if you pay attention to the facts. The question is what to do about it. We can disagree about what to do about it. I think before the rise of social media, there were certain sets of facts that came out of mainstream media, newspapers, Americans heard all the same set and can make their own decision. The problem is the facts are shifting. So doing something about reestablishing facts a, in a way that's apolitical, that it just shows the value of facts and evidence for purposes of making good decisions. Number four is this question of integrity. Um, I do think integrity matters in politics, just like it matters in everyday life. We don't want people teaching our children or taking care of our children or leading our places of worship who are corrupt and lack integrity. Um, again, John Adams, because power corrupts society's demands for moral authority and character increase as the importance of the position increases. So going back to common sense, common sense notions of how we live our own lives and having that kind of unity with each other when we make decisions about politics, I think is a path forward potentially. And the last, and I'll close with this, is what I call gratitude, that was not John Adams' word, um, but understanding that American democracy is a privilege, it's a gift, and it's fleeting. And he said, posterity, exclamation point, I think he's talking to all of us, many, many years ago, you will never know how much it cost the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you make good use of it. And I think that's the message, so thank you. Thank you very much. So you are saying I should not let my kids eat pizza on the couch? I don't know. After four, that rule went out the window. <laughs> By the fourth child, I don't enforce it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we'll, uh, uh, we have a lot to discuss, and we'll talk a lot more about the Constitution, and your introduction was perfect. But since it is Super Tuesday, since we are talking about the elections as well, th there's obviously, according to you, a, a constitutional crisis, or, or whatever you want to call it, what does that mean for November? What is at stake? What if the president gets re-elected and your country has a few more years of this? I think the viability of American democracy is on the ballot in November 2020 uh, because of what I just described. The, I've had debates with other scholars who are less concerned about American democracy and their answer will be people can vote in November but but they won't have an informed vote if we don't have this somewhat troubling conversation and I think what what is the danger for American democracy with four more years is 
we elected in 2016 a person with a personality type that everyone knew would mean um, pushing boundaries, uh, making decisions based on a gut instinct, uh, making decisions based on sort of a, a self-reflective point of view rather than, you know, what's kind of uh, best for, quote, we the people. I think without any checks, which we have right now, those instincts will continue. Um, they will, I think we'll see more boundaries crossed that Americans think are impossible. That would never happen in America, but of course... It what could. kind of boundaries? I think we could see political investigations, politically motivated investigations. Uh, we already saw with Roger Stone, the critique was that it was a politically motivated uh, 180 switch change by the Justice Department with respect to sentencing recommendations. You mean Roger Stone, his longtime advisor who was, you know, uh, uh, sentenced or, uh, you know, they wanted him right. so Roger uh, for Stone, a few years? Roger Stone was prosecuted by Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was appointed to be independent from the president. He was prosecuted and convicted on seven counts by a jury for uh, witness tampering, perjury, obstruction of justice, relating to his communications with WikiLeaks around the leakage of information that damaged Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. So Roger Stone was prosecuted and convict convicted based on his relationship with the 2016 Trump campaign. So they had independent prosecutors in the, in the DOJ. They all answered to the president. But since Watergate, as a matter of norm and practice, the Justice Department has essentially made decisions independent of the president. So people believe or see or perceive the Justice Department as apolitical. But in this instance, the prosecutors recommended a sentence of seven to nine years. Donald Trump tweeted that that was unfair. And then Bill Barr, the attorney general, intervened and the next day filed an amended sentencing recommendation um, that lowered it significantly. They did not actually put a number on it. But as a result, the four prosecutors withdrew from that case, which was a really rare thing. Out of protest, basically. We don't know that, but there's not really another rationale. Um, when they Remember, they worked for Robert Mueller. They were independent. And they, I think the message was, wait a minute, we can't be part of the president essentially pulling strings to help an aide who's going to jail by virtue of his relationship with the president. We should switch, by the way, because I'm sitting in the spotlights and looking at the audience, and it should be the other way around. Sorry about that. I don't know if I agree, but okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how come the, the, the framers of the Constitution didn't see this coming. Were they naive that somebody would grab power in this manner? No, I don't think they were na naive. I think they understood exactly that power could be grabbed in this manner. Remember, they were upset with King George III. They didn't want an, a monarchy with unlimited power where the law was the king's will, the king's wishes. The king could do no wrong unless the king gave you the, a right to sue him, for example. That's called a waiver of sovereign immunity. So that is why the framers set this up. And of course, there were different ways they could have set it up. Um, our friend John Adams, when he uh, drafted or helped draft the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, which was the first written constitution in the, in the states, he included a council that would oversee the executive, for example. He was a believer in executive power, uh, but there was that check. I'm not endorsing that necessarily, um, but, but I think the piece, at least one of them, that the framers anticipated but didn't address is the rise of a two-party political system. Right. Right. That's one of the, I think, the biggest problems. In addition, the framers could not agree on voting process. There is the right to vote, those words, do not exist in the original Constitution. They left that to the states. And so in America, we don't have a uniform system of voting. Uh, it really varies depending on your zip code. And because of that, it's a challenge to vote in America for a lot of people, which I think in other places in the world is hard to understand, where it's easier. 
Um, but voter I, I suppression, uh, gerrymandering, that kind of stuff. Yes, voter suppression, the three pieces, voter suppression, gerrymandering, and money in politics that influence uh, right now people in America to win public office need a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that money is now coming from sources that even the candidates don't know where they're coming from um, because of a Supreme Court decision which held that corporations can, under the First Amendment, spend all the money they want on ads, political ads, so long as they don't do it in coordination with the campaign. So uh, This was Citizens United correct. in 2012, the right. big, big court case. So we, we have now money that's that candidates need to get reelected, and it's not coming from individual voters. It's coming from what they call dark money to some degree, PACs, super PACs. Super PACs. Um, and so there's a disconnect between the individual voter, self-government, we the people, and what people in Congress are actually doing, because the consequences, again, for how they make decisions are not being felt through the voters, but they're being felt through the donors. Now, there may be a way to repair that. Uh, uh, you could convene another constitutional summit, actually change the constitution. Is, is there any serious movement dis discussing this? Yes, so there are two ways to change the constitution. One is Congress can submit a bill to amend the constitution, and that's how all the 23 amendments happened. Uh, and Congress passes that, then it has to go to ratification of the states. The other option is to start from scratch and have what's called a constitutional convention. And under the Constitution, the states have to pass laws wanting a constitutional convention, a certain number, two-thirds, I think, and then Congress will call one. And we're six states away in the United States, the last I checked, from a constitutional convention. And if that happens, there are no rules of the game. The last one was in 1787, <laughs> um, and it's hard to imagine it would what would be produced would be better than what we have. People on the left, some who pr who want a constitutional convention, want to change Citizens United because when the Supreme Court construes get, get money out of politics, get money out of politics more than anything else. Because when the Supreme Court of the United States interprets the Constitution, this gray area, that really functions as an amendment. There's no higher authority to interpret the Constitution than the, than the Supreme Court. Congress can't come in and pass legislation that's inconsistent with the Supreme Court decision that interprets the Constitution. There could only be a next Supreme Court decision Correct. overruling it. Exactly, basically. or a constitutional amendment. On the right, uh, I think there's a, a desire to have a constitutional convention to abolish the tax code, which would, of course, abolish the federal government. Uh, and you know, go to a different system. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> I don't know. So well, is, that's is, when we need foreign interference, maybe? In the constitutional <laughs> <Right>. convention? <laughs> so is the eagerness to... I mean, it only takes six more states. That's not a lot. I mean, it is a lot. Do you foresee this happening? You know, I, I don't have the deep dive empirical knowledge of this, but right. there are people who think this will happen. Uh, most Americans are not even aware of it. Uh, as I said, aren't even aware of how the Constitution functions, let alone this is a possibility. There are states that essentially passed legislation around an equal rights amendment many years ago to authorize that through a constitutional convention, uh, and I don't have the, the names off the top of my head, right. that have since repealed it. Right. So we could, if we get closer, see states say, wait a minute, we change our minds. We don't want that. <laughs> now, you're saying that the framers, one other thing the framers did not foresee was a, a, a two-party system. American politics right now is very tribal, obviously. Take the Republican Party that, you know, acquitted a, a Trump during the impeachment trial. One senator voted um, for impeaching him. That was Mitt Romney. Or yeah, for, on the first article. Right. Yeah, on the first article of, of those two. Uh, he's now... A, a, a paria within his own party. He's an, he's an outlaw. What explains the fact that of the that the party seems totally hijacked by President Trump? What is it just because of the, the policy? What explains it is today, Super Tuesday. Um, it's the process for choosing candidates. It's the primary process. 
for choosing candidates to the Congress. So you think of, okay, say there's a seat up in Congress, you have a Democrat versus a Republican. Before that Republican is chosen, there's a primary where they have several people running for that Republican slot. What's happening is people in the Republican Party who challenge Trump get what we call primary, where the base and Trump and that support group will nominate someone to challenge the dissenter, the person that challenged Trump. And then that person will get the re Republican base behind him or her. Don't need the Democrats for that, right? Uh, so even the small minority relative to the rest of the country that supports this president, that's enough to get people off the ballot. Uh, and then, and I think Republicans want to keep their jobs. Um, there, is, there is essentially Trump's way or the highway, and they understand that. And Mitt Romney is not afraid of it just because he's so popular or popular enough in his, his own home state. I really think, I mean, back to one of my last points, I don't know Mitt Romney personally, uh, but he has a very strong faith. And he explained it publicly as a, a decision, um, as a matter of his conscience and a sense of integrity. And I, I do have a lot of respect for that because he probably, and his fa he and his family will probably have a security detail um, to protect them for, for quite a while as a result of that. Now, the founding fathers, as, as, I, as I said, were mentioned during the impeachment trial many times. Adam Schiff, the main um, um, uh, impeachment manager of the Democrats, he said the founders gave us the tools to do the job. But, but apparently it's, it was completely fruitless. You know, it just didn't, didn't, didn't make a squash at, at all. Did, did, you ever, did you ever expect America to be at, at this particular point in time? Well, I'm not so sure if I've answered for myself the question as to whether it's completely fruitless. It didn't produce removal of the president. Uh, we it may did, affect voters. Yeah, and we did see an attempt to flex that muscle. They could have done absolutely nothing, and then you could say uh, that was less of a, an, uh, even less of an effort to protect the prerogative of, um, of the presidency. But I do think there, there are plenty of people who believe that going forward impeachment is not a reasonable mechanism. And part of that for holding the presidency accountable, part of that might be because of the party politics. Two thirds of the Senate need to vote to convict. 51% 51 51 of the House needs to impeach. Right. So we have this imbalance that's baked into the Constitution itself. So some people say, listen, there's no way any president will get two thirds in the Senate. And because of um, how senators are chosen, it's very hard to remove and change senators. Um, so we won't see a big shift in that the population of Democrats versus Republicans in the Senate in our lifetimes, probably. It's mostly, it's obviously a majority of Republicans right now. Would you say they, are you of the opinion that the Democrats should not have done this, knowing that, that he would always be acquitted by, by the Senate. I mean, you have two camps, some saying, you know, it was their constitutional duty, which I guess may be your opinion. The other side saying, you know, in an election year, it's too big of a risk, don't do it. I'm of the opinion that they did the right thing, and I'm also of the opinion that they probably should have been, I am of the opinion, and they've made it public, they should have been more aggressive. The in, Democrats. The Democrats in protecting the prerogative of the legislature and the Constitution. Because again, it's the, it's the bridge that is supposed to last generations and generations, and that's what matters. What, what should they have done differently without getting too much in the weeds? But right. what's. Well, the second article of impeachment was about obstruction of Congress. Right. And the Dem meaning no documents, no witnesses. Um, there are two Supreme Court cases from the last two presidents who tried to defy subpoenas, President Nixon and President Clinton. They went to the Supreme Court and said, we have absolute immunity. You cannot touch us. Article 2, we're the boss, we're president. Supreme Court said, no, no, no. You don't have complete immunity from process. You might have the ability to say no to certain pieces of information, national security, deliberative privilege, there are certain things you cannot answer, but you can't just say I won't show up at all. Then, so those were not congressional subpoenas, but then what we had is Trump saying, 
anyone who worked for me has immunity that I don't even have. And it's a matter of logic. A court's not going to say, listen, the president doesn't have absolute immunity, but anyone who works for him does. So I'm saying this because the, I believe the Democrats should have gone to court. They should have subpoenaed all of these witnesses. They should have moved to compel. They should have gotten court order after court order after court order, either saying you must comply or, which is what happened last week, the courts, this is too political, we're out. Because if, if the court said you must comply, then they could go before the Senate and say we've got the third branch of government as a matter of constitutional law backing us up, that this is legitimate. If the court said like they did last week, listen, we're out, they could go back to the Senate and say the only way to protect the Senate's power to gather information from the White House is through impeachment. Um, so that's number one. I think, you know, they they could have probably done more with the articles that they did. One of the, they did issue, one of the big arguments the Republicans made was that there was no crime actually alleged and as a matter of constitutional law, I think that's wrong. I think the weight of authority is that you don't need a crime to impeach. Um, but they could have framed those as lawyers in a way that actually alleged a crime because obstruction of Congress under the United States Criminal Code is a crime. Uh, so there's a few things there, and I think in the Senate, they could have forced the Chief Justice's hand to actually rule and strike statements from both sides that were inaccurate. If we can't hear the witnesses, we can't see the evidence, we have lawyers summarizing the evidence, I would have liked to see if I were on the team, I would have said, Your Honor, Please strike from the record the statement by Jay Sekulow, XYZ, that is inaccurate. He's the president's lawyer. Yeah. yeah, the president's lawyer. That's inaccurate. Again, a message to the American public, there's a cop on the block to make sure that the information going to you, at least in this chamber, is accurate. Now, of all the, the pillars of democracy, I hope to think that the free press, the free press is one of them. Um, uh, you know, part of a different system of checks and balances. Obviously, the, the president uh, or this administration has harmed or has been trying to harm the free press. So is there any pillar left of a functioning democracy? I mean, it sounds overly dramatic, but where's the, where's the hope? What, what still stands? Well, a couple things come to mind. I do think, uh, I mean, I've now been a member of the press the last few years. I never expected to. Um, Trump is, uh, I guess, for career-wise, not been a bad thing, but um, but I do I do have a lot of respect for the press. I think there still is tremendous integrity in, in certain parts of the press. I, I think the media but needs they're also to, being attacked every day yeah, from, from the White House. And I think there needs to be a re-strategizing. I don't know if this will fix it around false equivalencies, giving both sides of every story. Um, that's number one. So I do think the free press is really important. Number two is, of course, in the United States, we have a bunch of sovereigns called states. Uh, and so state governments under our Constitution still have some autonomy. Remember, at the time the Constitution, the federal government uh, was created, most Americans were Virginians or New Yorkers. That was where their loyalty was. They did not want to give up their power um, as individual states, and states are now stepping in, I think, um, and Americans need to pay attention to those elections. States and local governments are a place where there can be some order. Uh, I think the third piece has to do with career government officials. I was in the Justice Department. I also, as you mentioned, worked for Ken Starr. I, was, I worked for the Federal Trade Commission. I was a, a clerk for a federal judge, so I had a fair amount of experience in the federal government. Those people are there because they really care. Um, they care about serving the public. They're professionals, most of them are very dedicated. One of the, I think, fallouts of this particular administration is sort of mass exoduses of those career people. We're seeing some of the critiques now with coronavirus and having uh, some of you know, the expertise within the federal government basically leave um, or be asked to leave. I do think there are still people in government that have, like the whistleblower, for example, that will take it on themselves to make decisions in the interests of the public, uh, but four more years of it, I'm not so sure. And also the fact that the whistleblowers, well, again, we don't know if impeachment was fruitless, but the whistleblower got death threats. He did not get any help from 
um, you know, the, the people in the administration, basically. We have a very politicized uh, Department of Justice, maybe more so than, than you have ever seen before. Oh, for sure. for sure. So it's very discouraging for any next whistleblower, or not? Right. I think that's, that's, the, that's certainly a deep concern. And um, we, not, we saw not only a lack of protection for the whistleblower, but we saw um, urging from the president and his supporters to actually out right. the whistleblower and make that public. And I think um, that is some putting someone's and someone's family in danger. And that, that person exercised a statutory right. Um, that complaint went through the director of national intelligence under the statute. If the director of national intelligence found it credible and urgent, then it had to go automatically to Congress. Here's another place where the White House bypassed a piece of legislation and didn't turn that over. I've read that statute very carefully. Mm -hmm. The word is shall turn it over. It's not may turn it over. It's not only if Bill Barr says it's okay, turn it over. Sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, you know, I toggle between sort of sounding the alarm, the canary in the cone line, and not wanting to get people so worried that they give up. Uh, because I think if you do nothing, nothing 100%, that is the outcome. It, nothing good will come of doing nothing. Now, the fact that this impeachment trial failed, and again, let's, let's wait until November, but, you know, he's still in, in office, uh, which gave him a lot of, uh, the president, a lot of energy. We spoke about the Roger Stone case, him interfering in, um, in, in, in this case. Um, right now, it seems everything is, is possible since the president thinks and knows he'll, he'll get away with it. The Democrats won't try impeaching him again, probably. Um, so where does that leave us? If he gets a second term? Yeah. Well, we never know what's going to happen out of the White House with Donald Trump. So as far as potential behavior that could alarm the country, I'm not so sure we can count impeachment off. We just don't know mm -hmm. what is in the future for him. Um, I think it's highly unlikely. I think a lot of the political capital was spent. I agree with that. Number two, of course, is that it's not just Trump and whoever the Democratic nominee on the ballot in November. The United States Senate's on the ballot in November. And the Senate has a tremendous amount of power. And a, a few seats switching uh, and moving the Senate to the, the Democratic side would certainly give energy to the prerogative of the legislature to actually start functioning in a bipartisan manner. Uh, so that's number two. But, but I do... Overall, uh, as I said in the beginning of the remarks, I think American democracy is on the ballot in November 2020. It's not just picking a president, because if we have four more years of unaccountable um, activity, given the precedents that were set in the first four years, um, then I think it, it's quite dangerous for American democracy. And even as a matter of the criminal justice system, right, the Department of Justice memo protects the president effectively not legally, but practically from prosecution while he's in office, the statute of limitations for federal crimes, which is basically the, the deadline on which a prosecutor has to bring a charge is five years. So if he's in office for eight years, he will walk out and be immune as a private citizen from pro for prosecution from any alleged crimes committed in the first three years of office. So even as a private citizen, the judicial branch would not be positioned to hold a, a two-term president accountable. Right. Now, one of the arguments of Alan Dershowitz, another one of President Trump's um, lawyers, he, he said during the trial, if a president does something which he believes will help him get elected in the public interest, that can never be a quid pro quo that ends in impeachment, which reminds everyone of you know, what Nixon's lawyer said, you know, if the president does it, it's, it's not illegal. Yeah, so he got a tremendous amount of criticism for that, backpedaled right. a little bit in the moment. Just a little bit. When I heard that, um, I, I felt in a way... He's a famous lawyer. He's a famous lawyer. He's a Harvard Law professor. I've been on MSNBC with him. Um, but he's a criminal defense lawyer. So, you know, there are different kinds of doctors. There are different kinds of lawyers, right? 
A criminal defense lawyer is oriented towards making every conceivable argument to protect his or her client from jail. I mean, of course, we're talking about a pink slip or losing a job when it comes right. to impeachment. But I think that was his orientation. He is not a constitutional scholar. So I think he might have, as we say, gotten out in front of his skis a bit mm -hmm. in making that argument on behalf of his criminal defense, not a criminal, but his defendant client. Right. Um, but of course it's wrong. The argument was, the argument was, and there are other conservative constitutional scholars that support Trump who don't make that argument. The argument was, okay, if you think about the preamble to the Constitution, we the people, we the people, the idea is it's self-government. We're the bosses of our own government. The Constitution is just a job description. We are the bosses. That's the idea. Um, and that the president is essentially a fiduciary. He's not there for himself. He's there to serve the people. So if, say, you, all of us who have you know, trust funds with millions of dollars, I'm joking, of course, but if you, if you have a trust fund with a fiduciary and they start spending it in ways that are irresponsible, that fiduciary is liable. Likewise, the president is there to act on behalf of the people. What Dershowitz said was, if in his mind, staying in power indefinitely, essentially, is what's best for the people, that's not impeachable because that must be what's best for the people. And of course, that looks like King George III. Right. And as one thing we know, our friend John Adams said, like I said, posterity, you will never know how much it cost the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you make good uh, use of it. I, I mean, Americans post-World War II, maybe the Vietnam era, um, they don't understand what it means. And I say Americans that were, that were born there, certainly naturalized Americans who came from other parts of the world that don't have functioning democracies, that don't have the freedoms that are actually meaningable because they're enforced and because we live in a society that respects the rule of law, those Americans really understand what's at stake, many of them. Um, but Americans who grew up in sort of peace and prosperity, or prosperity, Bill Clinton, we had a surplus, he was impeached for you know, affairs, and people were, oh, well, you know, this doesn't affect me, and it really didn't in a way in terms of an abuse of power. It started out with the Whitewater investigation that you were a part of. I, yes, it did, and nothing came out of that other than he lied. Um, <laughs> he got in trouble. It was the cover-up, not the, not the right. act. Um, uh, but, I, but I think there is this sense that, oh, well, American democracy will always be there. The sun rises and sets. It'll always just reset itself. It's like Control-Alt-Delete, that great thing on a computer where it's freaking out and you just do Control-Alt-Delete and it goes back to normal and it's like, oh, this is great. Um, I think there's a sense of Control-Alt-Delete, this will happen. And Americans need to understand what John Adams said, which is you have to fight for this. We fought and died for this. Uh, and if it, people, if it becomes palpable for Americans, I think they would. They would do what our founding fathers and mothers did, but the question is, what's the time to do that? What's the time to pay attention to this issue? I argue it's now. Uh, it's not December of 2020, if, if he gets a second term, if this particular president, and I should say, this job description for the presidency becomes four more years. Right. Tracy will be so happy that you mentioned John Adams every <laughs> I don't think this institute has ever had a guest that mentioned John Adams well, as, it, as it, much it, as you did. It's like it's right there, right? How could I not? F final question: a, 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 a scenario, an uplifting scenario, oh, okay. or not? Um, let's say the election in November is close. It comes down to, you know, the margin is, is razor thin, and, and President Trump says, "You know, I don't, I don't buy it. Not gonna go." Okay, so I keep trying to get out of gloom and doom, and you keep bringing me back to gloom and doom. <laughs> I You're get, welcome. I get this question. I, I, guess, I, I guess I'm guess i serious. Question. Since, no, I since in the introduction I'm we joking, spoke. No, 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 I know, but I, I mean the, the peaceful transfer of power. No, you, you were optimistic in your introduction. I'll give you that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is another thing. Okay, so imagine this. I don't think many people would argue that this particular human being's temperament is such that that is beyond 
the pale for him, or that I think most people would uh, would admit at this point that is something that's not inconceivable for his personality. Um, so then the question becomes, like I started in my talk, okay, if that were to happen, what are the checks, right? Um, I don't know what Congress could do. They don't. They you, don't. You have could a build board. build a different White House. <laughs> I don't know. That's true. We could have. We could break up. Some people talk about that. We could just breaking up is hard to do. We could have multiple Americas. Um, Congress is probably out. The judicial branch could be utilized through the criminal justice system. But remember, who's in charge of the criminal justice system? Who's in charge of the police force? That think of my analogy with people surrounding your house, right? Who would be the ones that you'd call up to say, get, get the guy out of the, the White House? It would be the people who answer to him. It would be the people within the Justice Department, the FBI, it would be the military, all of them under the Constitution, under Article Two, answer to the President. Uh, I don't know what would happen. I don't know whether there would be a sort of... Uh, you know, a mutiny of conscience, conscience where people said, you know, within the ranks, listen, I'm going to adhere to the new president's desires and, and enforce the rule of law, even though this person hasn't been sworn in. I don't know if we would, as Americans, and I think the Democrats fairly sometimes take criticism for just caving and saying, well, just hopefully it'll be better in four more years. I, I don't know. Um, I think there's also a concern, frankly, given that we have a problem with firearms in the United States, um, that there would be some, some support for the president that's outside uh, the chain of command of the government to keep him in office. I, I don't know. Uh, these are all- some kind of militia. Correct. These, I mean, I'm speculating. I have no reason, but there are people really care about their guns in America um, and they're ready to use them. And um, so these, these, are, these are serious concerns. Uh, if there is a wider margin, I think it's less of a concern. Um, but, but there have certainly been signals that this would not be, this is, this is not a fantasy. This is not complete exaggeration. Um, this is not a nothing burger, as we say, to have the conversation. Okay. <laughs> is the bar open? <laughs> Thank you for now. Uh, we'll continue our conversation in a little bit. I want to give the floor. <laughs> we'll continue our conversation, but first I want to give the floor to Wim Voermans, who will talk about the Constitution, the different constitutions, and about the importance of telling the story of the Constitution. Wow, what a crowd. Um, I must admit, there's some form of professional envy when I'm standing here. I'm a law professor in the Netherlands, constitutional law. And when you see uh, Professor Wehde, my, my, my colleague, going on about the American Constitution, the crowd it draws, um, that, that, that's really something. Um, most of the time, we Dutch uh, constitutional law professors get invitations. We get a lot of invitations of associations of insomniacs and, and, and <laughs> clubs like that. Uh, so tell people to sleep. And it was the world, uh, the, the world that springs to the word that springs to mind when discussing the Dutch constitution is boring. Uh, uh, thank you, Elko, for that. But that 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 is what happened, and it's not my lifelong mission to uh, make it more exciting because sometimes exciting constitutions have a high price. Uh, that, that, that just sprang to my mind. Uh, but um, the Dutch constitution is fascinating as well. It's the second oldest in the world. Whatever the Norwegians say, they're wrong. We have the second oldest constitution in the world, dates back to the 29th of March of 1814, and it has uh, our rules of the game, our structure, our political structure as well. It is not a very exciting document. We are not the most exciting country in the world, maybe, uh, but it is uh, workable and it works. But same uh, as with the Americans, uh, Professor Wheely, uh, 
Kim said just now, that an Annenberg uh, Policy Center survey showed that the Americans, they revere their constitution, they revere it, but they're very poorly informed about the contents of it. Only 25% can name the three branches of government. Um, the same goes for the Netherlands. Um, a 2008 survey learned that 84% um, of the Dutch interviewed of 1,200 uh, respondents said, 84% said, we believe that the constitution is important. Uh, 94% even said that. But 84% said, we, we do not know the content at all. Of the 16% that said, yes, I know what is in it, uh, male, uh, male people my age, uh, that, that were the 16%, overconfident, saying, listen, I, I know my stuff, I know it. We took a little test, six questions, and more than three quarters failed the test. They didn't know. And, and more than three quarters had more than three wrong answers. Um, is that a bad thing? Yes, of course in some respect. Uh, Professor Guy Fortman is sitting here, he's banging the drum on let's liven up our constitution, let's think about our constitution, discuss it, uh, and, and most people will say why don't we have this same reverence for our Dutch constitution, 200 years old, like the Americans have. We look up to the Americans for that. But even the Americans don't know their constitution. Um, um, but the president maybe knows that Donald Trump is a recurring uh, element in uh, what we have discussed here today. But for sure, he has made public comments on the Constitution when in office. But before he got elected in 2016, he showed his mettle uh, in a meeting with uh, senators, Republican senators, in July 2016. He uh, solemnly promised, he vouched, that would he become president, he would always defend wholeheartedly, with all his commitment, Article 12 of the Constitution. That's, of course, nice to know. So it's not all bad what President Trump said. He lives up to the Constitution, Article 12. He would defend it with his life, even, he said. And it would be wonderful if the American Constitution had an Article 12. <laughs> it only has seven articles. Um, and maybe he was mistaken, so if we had looked to the 12th Amendment, but that couldn't be the case, because that's on uh, the, the joint package that you choose a president and a vice president on one ticket. So that couldn't be it. Whatever uh, his idea was, he, he vouched that he would do something with the Constitution, and he lived up to that, uh, I believe. Um, but it is, uh, we can make jokes about uh, uh, constitutions. Um, constitutions do matter, I believe. Um, and there is a lot of evidence for that. Even um, dull constitutions like the Dutch ones or political battlegrounds uh, like the American constitution, they do matter. And I believe uh, Professor Whaley, and in her book, makes the argument Beautifully, that it's about language, it mobilizes us, it touches us. And that's, that's what I try to study. If you study the Dutch constitution, there's no employee for you. So I try to study them all, I've read them all. Uh, you, you can read them nowadays, they're in the Constitute database, they're all in English, there's, these are all official translations. And, and, and what, what uh, as an, uh, a scholar interested me is what is it that makes constitutions work. And one can say it's the rules, it's the arbiters that we, we should have uh, a police force that, uh, that looks into it. But then police uh, are part of the system as well, of the story as well. And the thing that interested me is the sort of mystery we have in the world today that 189 countries out of the 193 that we have, have a written constitution. There's 98% even. And then we have three that have a constitution which is spread over more documents. And then there's one country in this world which is so very unique and special. They tell it to one another. 
they are very proud of having an unwritten constitution. So they have an oral one. That's the United Kingdom. Uh, they have documents as well. Uh, but they, they are very proud of having an unwritten one. That's the only one in the world. But 189 out of 193 have a written constitution uh, today. And that's a near global coverage. Uh, and that may not seem all that strange until we realize that 87% were drafted after 1950 of, this, uh, of these 189. And as many as 74% are uh, from after 1975. We were only put into place after 1975. So that's, that's really strange. This worldwide proliferation of constitutions over the past decade is one of the most remarkable and understudied phenomena of our time. What is it that it does it? Why do more people live under a constitution than under a roof? Why are constitutions more popular than Brad Pitt or pizza? And what has countries made adopt these documents in droves, even countries that do not intend to live up to all of the lofty ideals and principles expressed in it. Why is that? And why are modern constitutions, if you study them, coming to resemble each other more and more? That's even more of a mystery. Why are modern constitutions doing that? Surprisingly, little academic literature is about that. But uh, again, this wonderful book by uh, Professor Whaley has the answer for you. And I have tried to un unravel it as well. And it is. A wonderful story. The most powerful things we have in human uh, cooperation are stories. Money is a story. Market economy is a story. Uh, Piketty has made uh, the, the point. Inequality, market economy, it's ideology. It's a sort of a story that people can believe in. Uh, and, and that's really uh, uh, important to know. And in, in my book, The Story of the Constitution, I've looked into this uh, the, from the, the point of history, philosophy, cognitive sciences, and things like that. There's very little law and, and legal provisions in it, but I've tried to find, and I think I found it, uh, the, the root cause of the popularity of constitutions lies elsewhere, and it is the point that Professor Wiley made, made as well. It is in human nature. That's where the root cause lies. Last, Large-scale human cooperation requires trust and recognition uh, in ways that supersede uh, 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 to, for our cooperation, uh, in ways that supersede our neuro neurological limits. We, are, we have difficulty in trusting strangers, and we can do that with artifacts and concepts uh, and institutions that we uh, lay down in stories during our evolution, humankind developed artificial trust and uh, recognition institutions, stories to forge and grease human mass cooperation. Um, and constitutions try to create communities out of groups of uh, what would otherwise be virtual strangers to one another by promoting trust and recognition via basic norms and leadership and law. And that's the point you made uh, just now. And basically, constitutions are tales about leadership and laws governing group life. A constitution is a story of we and who we want to be. A story of belonging and the place of each member of a group recognition. And as a story, it may be the biggest story of modern humankind. And so, after all the worrying notes we now spread around, um, th there's some belief that the control or delete um, is the biggest story around. That, that we may believe that people can believe in this story. The evidence says the whole world is rushing to this story, 189 out of 193, and that would be maybe the story of hope. Uh, maybe not the actual uh, what's happening, but this story of constitutions, of the story of we that forges human cooperation. Um, and uh, as Steven Pinker, uh, one of my heroes, uh, has uh, said uh, in his wonderful book, uh, Enlightenment Now, um, of course, um, the, the people, uh, the, the, the misanthropes, uh, the, the people who are pessimistic, they always have the quick argument. The world is going down, of course, you see it all around you. But if you look at the last 20 years, 
then there's a big story of hope of big ideas. One of them is the Constitution, that we might be saved and uh, the, the world will not come to an end, that we have strong stories that we can cling to, and that might be, uh, I hope, uh, a story for the 22nd of November as well. Thank you very much. Now, if you tell people to vote on the 22nd of November, they will for forget to vote on the 3rd of November, which is actually the election. Yeah, that's the outcome. This is another way to suppress the votes. <laughs> Thank you, um, Professor Fuhrman, for your introduction as well. And not to take away from the optimism, but I guess that, so it's, it's wonderful news that almost every country does have a constitution. It's, it's only of value, though, if people the people in power adhere to it, like we just discussed. So just having a constitution obviously is, is not enough. No, it's not enough. There's a, a wonderful scholar in the United States as well. She's called Kim Lynn Chapel, um, and, and Mark Graber, the big constitutionalist, who try to figure out how constitutions work. And it only works, it is a story, but it needs to be internalized. That, that, and that, that comes with education. You need to be constantly banging on the drum and constantly living this story for it uh, to work. So that's, that, that's the, the, the... And how do, you, how do you do that? Uh, by living it, by doing it, by sticking to the rules, by writing books like this one, uh, having the message out, like, 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 like Professor de Kai Fortman is doing, calling attention to it. Uh, the thing they always want uh, the, the law professors in the Netherlands to do is uh, we do uh, have a, a constitution that the children do not know, why don't you go to the high schools and tell them? And I always say, no, let's not do that, because the, the job is bad enough as we have it, and they will throw potatoes at us at, uh, in, at the Kalversraat. But the, the, living it, and uh, be serious about it, and uh, acting uh, upon it. The, but you, wise can words of act, you can only act upon it if, if you know it, so, it, so educating is a part of it, to, to be Completely honest, I'm, I'm not even sure what I was taught in school myself about the, the Dutch constitution. I just don't remember because I'm that old. Um, what, what are school kids in the Netherlands being taught about the constitution as of now? The right thing. And, and I, I'll explain how. Uh, the, 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 this is a sort of a riddle which is very difficult to get. But um, um, a big uh, sport in the Netherlands is soccer, football. Every kid uh, plays it, and uh, I live in a very small town near The Hague, no dorp, and there they have only, that's I, I think 3,000 people or something like that, very small, and they have three football clubs. So I went there on Saturday and I asked the uh, uh, referee, do you know the offside rule? Offside, that's a big thing in, in, in soccer, yes. I asked kids of six and seven years old, do you know the offside rule? Yes, of course. And uh, the, the arbiters uh, with the flags on the sidelines. Do you know the offside rule? Yeah, 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 this and that. Can you please then tell me where it is written? What's the article? Nobody knew. It's article 11, uh, paragraph 2 of the, uh, uh, the, the, the UEFA uh, rules. Uh, it's written down. It's 35 lines long. Uh, it begins with something which is counterintuitive. It says, uh, offside is not an offense. It's a situation, not an offense. They don't know where this rule is to be found, but they all know how to play the game, to recognize the situation, and what it's about. That it's unfair to have an advantage if you go uh, the, behind the, 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 the last lines of defense. And, and so they know. And that's the same thing with this 2008 survey. They asked, do you know these articles, and do you know this, and do, do you know that? No, they didn't. But then there's uh, the, the other experiment, and then he said, could you name what the most important constitutional values are in the Netherlands? In most countries, it's the freedom of speech and freedom of association. The Dutch kids and everybody say, equality, um, super majorities, fair play in politics, minorities, respect for minorities. They can list it without any hesitation. And then 
That, that's the living constitution for you, if you, if you can list that. So, never mind the articles, it's second nature ingrained in Dutch culture, I believe. So that's the uplifting uh, message maybe for the Dutch uh, constitution. That is up uplifting. Um, Kim, the, the, many Americans refer to the constitution in an, in an almost, well, I would say, fanatical way. That doesn't sound nice, but I mean, many revere it. Um, and, and then you have the originalists who say that all statements in the constitution must be interpreted based on the original understandings of it. And then you have those who claim the constitution is a living document, right? How, um, how, how fierce is that discussion and... Well, I guess you talked a bit about where you stand, but, 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 but talk about that, because the, these are two, two completely opposite camps. Yeah, so that is a fierce discussion. It's not only a fierce discussion within the academy, within scholars. It uh, basically started, uh, I think, when Justice Scalia came on the United States Supreme Court, um, but it is sort he of... He was the originalist. He was the originalist. The idea being, it's not up to me, federal judge, in 2020, to decide what this document means. I'm just a translator, I'm a scribe, or I, you know, I'm just here to read the words on the page and, and tell you what the words mean. That's my job, I don't have anything else, that's it. And so the problem with it is, a, is there are multiple problems with it, but that dichotomy has made its way into popular culture in the United States, where people believe that there is a right and a wrong way to read the Constitution, and I've debated this with other scholars, the problem is, is that I started out with my talk, it's an old document. I mean, what does, it, what does the word search mean? Um, in 2020, when there are bits of data out in the cloud, thousands and thousands of them that we create every day when we walk down the street and a video takes our picture or we get on Google and buy something or uh, we take a picture and post it on Instagram, the government can take all that data and run an algorithm and get all kinds of information about you. There's no way the framers of the Constitution had that in mind when they used the word search. What was, sorry to interrupt, but what was Scalia's, I mean, he passed away a few, what was his answer? Okay, his answer to that had to do, I mean, frankly, I think went a little bit in the, not so much living constitutionalism, the, the, the academic divide is between originalism or textualism, where you look at the language, and what we call functionalism or purposivism, where you look to the objectives. And he did. He said, search cared about homes. So Justice Scalia authored an opinion finding that the, a heat-sensing machine to detect uh, marijuana growing inside your home was a search. Of course, the framers didn't know what a thermal heat imaging thing was, um, but the idea was, well, the framers cared about the home. So that was a search because the government is penetrating the home. But even that, and I would argue, that is not a strict reading of the word search. I mean, I think search at the time was redcoats coming in and rifling through your one chest of drawers and your parchment paper. Like, that was it. Um, and, and so he was saying to himself, what's the purpose of the Fourth Amendment? So I just, I, I, I think that as scholars, we can debate which interpretations or methods of construing ambiguous language are better or where we should start and end. Some people might focus more on the objectives of a provision, some people might focus more on the dictionary in 1787. Um, I mean, literally, or the dictionary in 2000. But the idea that judges who oftentimes in these very controversial constitutional questions, justices issue five, four opinions. Five judges read the word search one way, four judges read it another way, that those four people can't speak English and don't know what the word search is. I mean, of course, the point is there are different ways of interpreting language, and I think it's damaging because voters are going to the ballot box now voting for presidential candidates, essentially who they believe will strictly read the Constitution and read the right to abortion, frankly, out of the Constitution. Um, and we could talk about that. That's there are lots of things I can say about that, but I think that that is really glossing over, um, and it's unfair to judges who 
read it in a way and explain why they're reading that way, rather than saying, I'm reading it the, this way because this is just the only meaning that it has. Um, I think if you can say this is the only meaning it has, you get the benefit of then not explaining why you picked that meaning and didn't join with the four justices on the dissent, dissenting opinion. Now, you mentioned the, the, the abortion debate. Um, uh, Professor Fuhrmanns and I, we exchanged emails before this evening, and it, we, we happened to be in Austin, Texas at the same time in January, and we happened to be present at the same rally at the Texas State House in January. This was an uh, anti-abortion rally, and you were there for a constitutional summit or, or convention. Not, not Right. So, so um, and the people there, yeah, they, they did want the uh, constitution uh, changed so that the right for an abo abortion, the right to an abortion would not be protected. W what did you take away from that rally, from your point of view, from as a constitutional scholar? First of all, that this debate was a constitutional debate in, in the minds of a lot of people. It, um, in the Netherlands, we have protests too, but this was the strangest protest that I've ever seen. Um, there, there, there were a lot of people. You, you, you were there. It was a very sunny day. That was nice. Uh, but there was a lot of police, so they were expecting something. There was some tension. And then <laughs> how um, I believe uh, the, the Americans live their constitution. So there were uh, people uh, shouting and uh, raising flags and, and somebody fired up uh, in front of the, the, the state house, uh, the, the state conqueror's house, fired out the people, we want this and we want that. And then all of a sudden it stopped and dropped. There were three Girl Scouts coming with an American flag and they all gave the Bellamy salute. So they all united in one moment. Maybe we have that with the national anthem at, uh, at some places, but this, this was living, uh, living society, sort of living constitution. They, they lived it there on, the, on this hill. That, that's, of course, I have a professional uh, way of uh, looking at this maybe. Maybe I saw something that wasn't there, but I believe it was. And then, then they all stood to attention. And for me, this was strange. We made the joke over dinner that the Bellum Institute, I pledge allegiance to the flag, and uh, etc. Um, I'll ask it around uh, in, in Texas as well uh, during the seminar. Whom of you would think uh, where this came from? What, what era? Uh, the, 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 I give you three choices. Would you think? Um, uh, so uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag and the country you stand for. Um, is it from the 18th century? the 19th century or the 20th century? Who believed the 18th century? 18th century? Beginning of the 19th century there, maybe. Okay, maybe it's not substantial anyway, but it is, uh, it began as an advertisement. It was a gimmick. It was used, it was a short poem to uh, sell flags. Uh, and, and it, it was uh, somebody who authored this text was uh, an advertising agent trying to sell flags for the 400 years of the landing of Columbus and the, the flags wouldn't sell so they needed to come up with something they made a gimmick and uh, they asked Boy Scouts to go school by school and say listen uh, the idea is that you say this Bellamy salute this Mr. was Bellamy was the author of it who was uh, uh, an agent of an advertising agency, and, and he made it. And, and, and a lot of people think, still think, that is part and parcel of the Constitution, that it's in the Constitution. So what, what does that mean for you? What does that tell you? That it is about the story, that it is about the big idea that it can unite people, even when they're protesting, uh, re really mad uh, on, on the government, that there is cement of society in the bigger story of the Constitution. And th that's the, the nice story, but please listen to what Professor Wheelie has to say. You need to kindle that, you need to maintain that, you need to uh, uh, tell that uh, over and over again. But they are very sensitive to that. But I have one more anecdote, if I may. Real that, brief. Uh, real brief. In 1980, there has been a scholarly analysis of the Declaration of Independence comes out that there had been 26 drafts of it. 
26 drafts and they, they went on and on and on on the Declaration of Independence. So, nice to know. Outrage in the Midwest. Could not be that there were 25 drafts of the Declaration of Independence. Strange for us. But it came out that they were outraged. Moses did not come down the mountain with the 24th draft of uh, the Ten Commandments. The, the, that there's something religious about the conviction on what the Constitution is that explains the fierceness of the originalist idea, maybe. Uh, that, and something we have too in the Netherlands as well, maybe in a different way. We live the story. And it is a controversial story, but the, I, I could see there on this mount in Texas how they lived it. It can be controversial, but it can be cement on the same time. So, and that's the wonderful message of uh, Professor Wheelie's book. Finally, before we go to audience questions, what for you is the, the, the most sacred part of the Constitution? The right to vote, which is not even in the Constitution. <laughs> I mean, should it's it, in the should Constitution. Should it be in the Constitution? It's in the Constitution, essentially in amendments that brought more people into the voting tent in the United States. So originally it was only white males who, were, who owned land. So it was rich white males. And then that was expanded to any white males. And then eventually it was expanded to uh, you know, people of color, black males, and then what, and women, whatever. So there are, there are and then you know, it expanded it based on age. So, so there are amendments that basically are, you cannot forbid someone from voting, but the actual, the right to vote is nowhere in the Constitution, but it's at the heart of the preamble itself, we the people, the idea of we're the bosses of our own government. Uh, should it be in the Constitution? I know we you mentioned, uh, Tracy mentioned that terrific play, how to, uh, what I, what the Constitution means to me. I saw it in New York, it's quite celebrated, and I think it's terrific for purposes of making the Constitution sexy. Whoever knew that would all be in one sentence. Um, but, but um, you know, her answer to the problems with the Constitution is to add stuff. Um, and we, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment's been back in the public in the United States for reasons that we can talk about, but um, I, my, the message of the book, I think, which you picked up in some of this discussion, is the words on the page, don't, they don't grow arms and legs and enforce themselves. Um, it's the enforcement of the words that we have, and we do that through the right to vote. So I'm very interested in reading your book. Um, one of my questions would be, of the 189 constitutions, how many of them are actually functioning to limit government power and preserve individual liberties rather than the piece of paper. And, and I'll say, I mean, another example I use, if you've ever renovated your kitchen um, or your bathroom and you give the $20,000 US dollar down payment and they do demo and they trash your bathroom to take out all the grouting and the tile and, you know, it's a complete disaster and you can't use your house and there's dust everywhere and they walk off the job with your $20,000. But you have a piece of paper. That's called a contract. We call that the Constitution. The piece of paper does not get a badge and become a police officer. It does not get a law license and go to court and get a court order. You have to enforce your contract. You have to go to court. You have to file a cause of action. You have to then uh, get before a judge. The judge has to issue an order. Then you have to go to the, the sheriff and get the sheriff to execute the order by finding that contractor and telling them you've got to pay back. And if they don't pay back, then you put a lien, you freeze their assets, you sell those assets, and then you finally get your $20,000 back. And that's the message. We have to enforce it, and we enforce it ultimately through the ability to choose our own elected officials. I want to give the audience, um, thank you, the chance to uh, ask questions. Um, is there some, is Mika here with a microphone? I'll just do it. Oh, there's a microphone here. Uh, yeah, you go. I would like uh, to know, uh, f um, from the constitutional point of view, uh, what's um, the position of uh, uh, Twitter? Uh, there's a president twi uh, tweeting all the time, and um, he can get himself in trouble, he can get the nation in trouble, he can give away secrets. Uh, there might also be judges who want, supreme judges who want to uh, Twitter. So. Um, What's your position about that? I mean, we haven't had a 
a situation like that before because Twitter hasn't been around for so long. They did not foresee Twitter. No, they did not foresee Twitter. I do think it's become um, a powerful mechanism for controlling the Republican caucus. Remember I mentioned earlier uh, that anyone who falls out of line can be primaried and challenged for the Republican seat, or at least the Republican nomination, and the president does that quite effectively through Twitter, which did not exist. Um, as far as legal limitations, I mean, in the United States, you can't say, uh, you can't say curse words or profanity on, on regular television or on cable, um, but there is not the same limitations when it comes to social media and the internet. There's a big divide between those two things, which is why we have a big problem, for example, with pornography, uh, including images of children in the United States. So the Twitter is the wild west of the American, uh, America right now. Um, when it, we've also heard, I just want to make one comment about the First Amendment. You said that's something people care a lot about. And this is also a myth. The President will say, my First Amendment rights, etc. Uh, another, I think, important takeaway here is individual, the, the, the uh, Bill of Rights is about limiting government power with respect to regular people. So people in office don't have, even regular government employees, don't have the equivalent First Amendment protections that private parties do. Um, so he doesn't have those protections, but in this moment we don't have any legislation that would confine his power. And of course, his position on a lot of levels is my power is unlimited. And we're literally having that debate right now in the United States um, as to whether Article 2 power, Article 2 creates the presidency, has any checks and balances, which is it's quite astonishing, actually. We didn't have, we had a similar argument, debate under Bush, um, who, of course, did, uh, got into a lot of trouble over waterboarding and other forms of torture in the war on terror. Um, and the argument there was there's unlimited power for the president in the, t in the context of commander-in-chief and war on the battlefield, that the president needs to be nimble to make decisions to keep the country safe. That was the Bush view of what we call the unitary executive, the power of the president. It is now morphed under Trump into unlimited unlimited power, and that, of course, can't be right. Not to get too much into it, but, but Obama enlarged the executive power of the presidency as well, right? Well, and Obama utilized um, the, certainly the, the commander-in-chief slash war powers in ways that got people upset. He got in trouble for using executive orders. Right. Um, but that's been around since the dawn of time. I mean, uh, every president, I think FDR used the most of the executive orders possible. That question on DACA, which some people might, uh, it's the, basically Congress wouldn't, has not passed immigration reform, and pr so the president- DACA, the, the dreamers, the young the kids dreamers. who came in. And actually, that wasn't an executive order, that right. was a non, I mean, that's very wonky, but right. the idea is, he, instead of going through Congress, he said, kids that w were b brought into the United States as children can stay. Um, and so people criticize that in an expansive, expansion of executive power. Uh, I don't think in that area that's a, a critique that's consistent with how other presidents have used that power. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, just over there. Yeah. Hi, this has been fascinating. Um, in the interest of free and, and truthful press, I understand you've been on, CN, on CNN and CBS and a couple other y Yeah, so I, I'm actually, I'm a... Under contract with CBS, okay. but yes, I've appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, PBS, NPR, BBC. Wonderful. You name I it. I think again. they need to get you over on Fox. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my question was, um, can you explain briefly what you think is the grip that this person in the White House has been able to expand over the whole GOP and why they're putting up with it? even though you think some of them privately don't agree? Is it about keeping their jobs? Is it about a, 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 um, abortion reform? Is it the evangelicals? Or, or is it a combination is, is of all grip, those things? His grip on what, do you mean? Sorry? Uh, his grip you? on the GOP. His grip on the Republican Party, on the Republican right? His grip party. on the party. Okay, yeah, yeah. sorry, I didn't quite get it. Because that's the thing that just, 
I don't understand at all is how he has got this power over the um, entire uh, population. Well, I think we discussed it already yeah, there's a bit, two right? Pieces. One has to do with, as I mentioned, this keeping the job thing, because they will be primaried. They, it's a sliver of the electorate that decides who's the Republican nominee for a, for a seat in Congress. Only, I mean, it depends on the state, but so the idea is his base, which is very strong, if you challenge him, they, they will put someone up against you who's more conservative, more loyal to Trump, you'll lose your job. They are worried about losing their jobs. There's that, number one. I think earlier in the administration, in speaking to people on the Hill, it really came down to not wanting to be publicly humiliated on Twitter for some of them. I mean, I've heard anecdotally that there were, you know, uh, you know grown adults in tears around uh, in, in Congress, uh, and I, I haven't verified that, but I've heard that story a couple of Like, that level of fear, because of course it affects all kinds of things. It affects your family, it affects your reputation, it affects, it's a, it's a painful thing, um, but I think since then, it's, since his power has grown, it really is about this idea, listen, I can be Mitt Romney, I can, I can challenge this, but I'll be out of a job. And I'm better off in my job than out of my job. So I will do what it takes to stay in my job. That's what's best for the American people. Thank you. Other questions? Um, over here, yeah. I'm a third year journalism student and I grew Jur up... Journalism? Yeah. I grew up watching Sorry. Ilko in, uh, in the United States. Sorry about that. And, <laughs> and I'm aspiring um, a foreign correspondent uh, in the United States and I was wondering uh, how did Trump uh, impact the expansion of the US presidency and our job as a journalist to, for future presidents to explain it to the people and my generation. So how has Trump expanded the US presidency? One of the big issues is the war powers. That has happened since World War II. Congress has the power to declare war, but it hasn't basically been the cop on that block. So that's one of them. You said, sorry to, you said explaining or expanding? Explain it. Expanding. Expanded. Oh, expanding. Okay. So that's Something one. with my ears. So. Um, I think with this president, I mentioned a number of the places where Congress's failure to enforce its rights under the Constitution to oversee the president, they have allowed the president to push through those. So he then has more power. There are other parts of the Constitution that the president has now doesn't need to worry about. You might have heard the word emoluments if it's made it across the pond. Um, the idea is Presidents can't get goodies from foreign governments. Um, that's happened under this president. Congress hasn't done anything. Uh, you mentioned in the opening remarks, not turning over his tax returns. That's been a norm that's typically been happened for every president, not because they'll go to jail, but because that's just what you do. Um, he hasn't done that. There's actually, uh, in the interest of time and my bad memory at this point, I did actually write a piece for Politico um, that listed all the places, so if you, if you want to look, I will like, read it. Yeah, I'll let answer that. But but I think um, but I think that to answer that question, you have to look as much at Congress in sort of letting letting people letting the president speed and not handing out the tickets as much as you look at the president pushing certain norms of conduct and uh, basically even violating laws and standards. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Final questions. Is there maybe a woman with a question? Otherwise I, have to, otherwise I have to give my sister a turn who's in the audience and she will not like that. Yes, over there. Last question. A woman with a question. Um, I was an attorney in the United States for a long time and I know that many of the judges at a certain point were Reagan appointees which really affected the way I looked at the courts. And I grieve now about the courts and the future of the courts with the appointments that Trump is making. What do you think is happening with the courts? What, how are they functioning and what can we expect uh, will happen? You know, in, will they be around for the next 40 years and make that kind of lasting mark on American society? Great question because e e even if he's not reelected, part of his legacy will be judges everywhere. Well, it's his legacy, and it's the legacy of the uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. 
And you're absolutely right. Um, this is, it's been an, un, first of all, under Obama, Mitch McConnell made it really difficult for any federal judges to be appointed. He just didn't bring them to the Senate floor, including the president's own pick for the Supreme Court, Merrick Garland, who was actually a pretty moderate judge. I've appeared before him. So basically blocking that and then, you know, hundreds of federal judges. Um, there are a couple things that have happened with that. They shortened the rules for debate on judges to, I can't, I don't know the numbers, but significantly. So these people are coming through very quickly. They also had, the American Bar Association typically had, as I think you mentioned, rate judges for competence. They were rated some of these nominees incompetent. They were appointed anyway and confirmed. And then I think recently I heard that they're not even taking in consideration the ABA. The other thing that traditionally has happened with federal judges is something called blue slips or blue papers where a senator from the opposing party as a matter of norms and respect could always veto a nominee. So if it's a Republican president putting up a Republican judge, essentially as a matter of you know, just getting along with the other side, bipolar sort of governing, or um, that bipolar, um, I guess that's a Freudian slip there. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that the opposing party, the pr senator could veto, and they would just pick another Republican. All that's gone by the wayside. I don't know the answer to, in the lower federal courts, what's gonna happen. We'll have to see over generations. Um, I mean, if they're incompetent, I just don't want anyone in a position of power with incompetence. There's nothing we can do about any of it because federal judges have lifetime appointment. They're, they're on for life. Um, you could make the argument, we've seen this with some Supreme Court justices, where once they're on the federal bench, unlike members of the Congress, they don't have to worry about a, a reelection. They will start actually making decisions based on good judgment. That's possible. That's in the structure of the Constitution. At the Supreme Court level, already, it's been, you know, close to devastating. Um, and I point, I mean, I, 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 I know some of the justices, I mean, they're very smart people, um, but the one I point to, if you ask me what's the most important part of the, uh, of the Constitution, the right to vote, is the Rucho versus Common Cause case, where the court not only said we won't take this particular case, but essentially said we will never take a case, no federal court in the future of the United States of America, no federal court can take a case challenging gerrymandering, which is essentially state legislators carving up congressional districts in these tortured ways so that they will always stay Republican or always stay Democratic, regardless of what the voters want. And most gerrymandered districts are Republican. There are Democrats too. But the Supreme Court and a split decision, conservatives on the court said, we are out. If you want to fix political gerrymandering, go back to the gerrymandered politicians. I mean, you know, my 10 year old understands that that doesn't make logical sense. Um, and I just think it's quite unfortunate. So, so we'll have to see. I'm, I'm less worried, frankly, about abortion because under a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court held that there isn't uh, basically a right to abortion in the same way as we have other rights, like a right to be free of uh, racial discrimination or, or and intermediate, intermediate scrutiny, we call it, for gender. The court essentially said, you know what? If a state wants to pass a, a law that burdens uh, the right to abortion, they can do it so long as it's not undue. So what do we see? We're seeing all of these cute things like, oh, you can only have an abortion from someone who has, and I don't say cute in a good way, but said someone who has privileges at that hospital, or oh, you have to wait 48 hours, or oh, you have to get your spouse's consent. And then the question is whether there's a, an undue burden. Burdens are okay, and so what's happened is the chipping away at the, the feasibility, the realistic possibility of getting an abortion, even though it's technically protected. And who is this affected? Low-income women. Women who have means can go to a state where they can get an abortion or can go to Canada or can fly to Europe. This has been a, this has been already, a, you know, a disproportionate 
uh, de devastating impact. There are some states that have one abortion clinic, and these, you know, a lot of women are single. They take, you know, single moms in poverty with multiple kids, they can't take two days and then go wait for the 48 hour waiting period, have someone watch their kids. I mean, they're in shift work, they don't have, they don't have uh, days off, they don't have uh, benefits. I mean, that, and as far as abortion, that's the thing people get really upset about in the United States when it comes to Supreme Court. I, th I think that ship has sailed in a way, um, and in, in ways that don't affect people like me and my children, but unfortunately affect the people that need the most protection in, the, in our country as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for that. I wish we had more time for questions. We don't, um, but hopefully the, both professors will stick around. Please, a warm applause for Professor Whaley and Professor Kuhn. Thank you also for me. I will keep it very short. Um, I think that Heidi Schreck and Donald Trump would be quite surprised to be mentioned in the same context of adding things to the Constitution. Heidi Schreck wanted things added and Trump has added an article of his, all of his own. That was news to me. Um, our upcoming events on April 2nd, we will have a preview of the new series that Elko has made uh, for the NTR uh, on Texas. And we are also bringing in one of the people who was in the series, a uh, professor of uh, creative writing at the University of El Paso. And uh, we'll be uh, showing the, one of the installments uh, before it's actually on TV. May 26th, uh, a very interesting woman, the mother of Jonathan Safran Foer, Esther Safran Foer. She has written her own sort of sequel to Everything is Illuminated. Looking forward to that very much. On June 10th, Frank uh, Wilderson on his book, Afro-Pessimism. And on June 20th, I'm pretty sure, June 20th, Madeleine Albright is coming back to the John Adams. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to keep up with what we do, sign up for our newsletter on our website, follow us on Facebook, come back soon and bring a friend. Thank you so much.